What is going on with the sun? Why were the northern lights visible as far south as Mexico? Is the sun okay? These are very good questions, and we're going to dive into everything you might want to know about how the northern lights work, why they're so difficult to predict, the sun solar cycle, solar maximum, and even a conspiracy theory about the northern lights. Let's start with the sun solar cycle, because this all ties back to our host star. The sun is on an 11 year cycle driven by its magnetic field. Every 11 years, the magnetic poles of the sun flip, and the months leading up to and after that flip are characterized by intense solar activity. Some solar cycles are more active than others. We are currently in solar cycle 25, and it is ramping up much faster than scientists initially predicted. While they first thought solar maximum would arrive in mid-2025, it turns out that we're basically in, or very near, solar maximum now. Scientists also thought that this would be a weak period of solar maximum, but that hasn't been the case. As you can see, and this will be a theme in this video, solar activity is difficult to predict. Scientists look forward to solar maximum because it's a chance to study the weird inner workings of our sun. And we all look forward to solar maximum because we get to see the aurora. The sun is busy fusing hydrogen into helium at its core, but a lot of the other inner workings of our sun are a mystery. What we do know is that the heat that this nuclear fusion generates creates extreme temperatures within our star's core. We think it's around 27 million degrees Fahrenheit or 15 million degrees Celsius. This heat travels to the convection zone in our sun, which is above the sun's core, and it turns superheated gas into plasma, which is basically gas that's so hot that it carries an electrical charge. That plasma moves through the sun, sort of the way currents run through our ocean, and this movement generates the sun's magnetic field. This process is called the dynamo. Sunspots are the visible manifestation of the dynamo, the movement of the sun's magnetic field. We determine the sun's 11-year solar cycle by how many sunspots it has. Peak sunspot activity is when the sun is at solar maximum. Sunspots are cooler, darker regions that are concentrations of the sun's magnetic field on the star's visible surface. When I say cool, I'm talking relatively. While the visible surface of the sun, the photosphere, is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 5,500 degrees Celsius, sunspots are around 6,300 degrees Fahrenheit or 3,400 degrees Celsius. In sunspot regions, the sun's magnetic field is very strong. We don't know exactly why these sunspots form, but the prevailing theory is that the sun's magnetic field is like a rubber band. Eventually, it can become twisted and twisted and twisted and then snap. When it snaps, these areas rise to the surface as sunspots. They can form over periods of few days and last for months. Smaller sunspots can cluster together to form larger ones, and when that happens, there's often a ton of solar activity that can affect the Earth. NOAA predicted that solar maximum would occur between January and October 2024, with the maximum number of sunspots between 137 and 173. As of the morning of May 13th, there were 186 sunspots on the sun. In contrast, in 2019, when the solar cycle began, there were 274 days that went by without sunspots. Solar minimum for the cycle was December 2019. This beast is AR3664, and it's mostly responsible for the solar activity we saw over the weekend. This gargantuan sunspot is 17 times wider than the Earth. This sunspot is so big that when it was pointed straight at us, it was visible through solar viewers with the unaided eye. You don't even need solar binoculars. Remember, don't try and look at the sun without proper eye protection. Over the past week, along with another sunspot region called 3663, it has sent out a flurry of solar flares and coronal mass ejections, which can cause the northern lights to appear. Solar flares are basically giant explosions on the sun. We think they're tied to sunspots, and they happen when these sunspots release their energy. Solar material becomes heated to millions of degrees in just a few minutes, and then it's released in a burst of radiation. These can last minutes or hours, and we can usually see them at most wavelengths of light across the spectrum. Flares can send electromagnetic radiation hurtling through space, but most solar flares are pretty basic. These are called A and B class flares, and we don't really see any impact to Earth from these. C class flares come next, and then M class. 
The highest categorization of solar flares is X-class flares. These are major events that will cause radio disruptions on Earth, and they are often the trigger for CMEs or coronal mass ejections. While solar flares do send radiation speeding towards Earth, CMEs are what people traditionally think of when they hear solar flares. They're bubbles of charged plasma and the sun's magnetic field that are violently released into space. Remember, the sun's plasma is gas that's so superheated by its core that this gas becomes charged. These energetic particles and magnetic field travel through the solar system away from the sun after they're ejected. They don't travel at the speed of light. Light takes about eight minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. When directed at the Earth, CMEs can hit us in as little as 15 to 18 hours, so we do have some advanced warning, but not much. They can travel anywhere from 250 kilometers per second to 3,000 kilometers per second, or 155 miles per second, to 1,860 miles per second. NASA has a really cool video of the journey of a CME thanks to the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which caught the CME in different wavelengths. Then the stereo A and B spacecraft, which orbit the sun ahead of and behind the Earth, caught the CME with their coronagraph, which blocks out the sun so the spacecraft can image the sun's upper atmosphere. This is traveling at 6.7 million miles per hour. As the CME approaches the stereo A spacecraft, notice the white across the screen? That's because the spacecraft is becoming overwhelmed by the CME's charged particles. This is a representation of how the CME traveled thanks to the collection of all this data. You can see what the charged particles did to Stereo A. When they impact the Earth's atmosphere, that's what creates the northern and southern lights. And that's what makes the northern lights so difficult to predict. I know a lot of people were upset that they missed the show Friday night because they didn't hear about it in advance. Well, we didn't know it was going to happen, really. Noah's prediction was not for that strong of an aurora. It was a wonderful surprise, but unlike the eclipse, we can't really tell you much about when or where northern lights are going to happen in advance. The aurora are the result of these charged particles from solar activity slamming into the Earth's atmosphere at 45 million miles per hour or 72 million kilometers per hour. They become entangled in our magnetic field and accelerate to the poles of the planet. They then interact with the particles that are already in our own atmosphere, heating them up, and that's what causes the aurora. If you did see the aurora over the weekend in an area that doesn't normally get it, you may have noticed it appeared colorless, with the color only coming out through a camera. I got a lot of questions about whether this is how the aurora always appears, and the answer is yes and no. When you're in a place where the aurora is weak, which if you're in Florida or Missouri and are looking at the northern lights, it's probably going to be weak. They do appear colorless to the unaided eye, but that is definitely not always the case. For example, when I was in Iceland and saw them, they had definition and color and they were actually moving around and you could see it with the unaided eye. The colors of the northern lights do also have significance. The traditional green is due to oxygen in the Earth's lower atmosphere. That's about 80 miles or 128 kilometers up. Hints of blue, purple, and pink are usually the result of nitrogen. However, a lot of people just saw a red sky. That is the result of oxygen in the Earth's upper atmosphere. It's not a common phenomenon with northern lights. Now, if you're wondering whether this will happen again, that's a question everybody's asking. It is very possible. The gargantuan sunspot 3664 is about to rotate out of view of Earth, but there's more sunspot activity on the sun. We're not done with solar maximum yet, and according to an article in Nature, some of the biggest solar activity can also happen after solar maximum. So it is very possible that this is just the beginning, and we're going to get some excellent displays over the next few months. So now let's turn to, given this heightened solar activity, are we in any danger? The answer is no, but there can be real consequences for events like this. Let's talk about the Carrington event, which was the most powerful solar storm on record and took place in September of 1859. It was the result of a sunspot that was similarly sized to our own 3664. It released a massive solar storm, a flare, and a coronal mass ejection. About 18 hours later, these hit the Earth. The northern lights were visible in the tropics thanks to the ensuing geomagnetic storm. So what would happen if an event similar to the Carrington event occurred today? Well, the internet would probably go down across the planet. There would be major disruptions in the power grids. Satellites might fall out of the sky. GPS would go haywire. It would be a big deal. 
This particular solar storm that we just had was powerful. There were some localized blackouts and GPS was a mess for a lot of people. As far as we know, no satellites fell out of the sky, but SpaceX's Starlink did have degraded service due to disruptions because of the geomagnetic storm. And if you're worried about the astronauts who aren't protected like we are by the Earth's atmosphere, well, there is a plan for that. While NASA said that the astronauts did not need to take precautions during this event, generally they can take shelter in the Zvezda module, which provides the best protection during solar storms because of its location within the ISS. These kinds of storms are also a concern for space travel to the moon, Mars, and beyond, which is part of the reason we're doing so much work in studying how radiation affects astronauts and what we can do to protect them. I want to end this video on kind of a weird note, because yes, there is a conspiracy theory about the Northern Lights. You probably saw a reference to it if you were looking at posts about it this past weekend. According to this theory, some people think that an organization called HARP, that's H-A-A-R-P, artificially created the Northern Lights. I don't need to tell you that this is not the case. To be clear, HARP is a real program. It's the high frequency active auroral program out of the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. It focuses on studying the ionosphere and sometimes it can heat small areas of the ionosphere and observe the effects. HARP conspiracy theories are abundant for some reason. People say HARP can do everything from controlling the weather to mind control. Literally, the official HARP FAQ on the website says that no, HARP can't control the weather or do mind control. In this case, people are saying HARP created the Aurora Borealis over the bulk of the North American continent. It cannot, in fact, do this. The program has created artificial aurora before, but in small areas of Alaska. But people are fired up because apparently there was a HARP experiment going on May 8th through 10th. Supposedly there was a release. I have not been able to independently confirm this because the only releases I saw posted were on conspiracy theory websites and I did not want to go wading even further into this mess. But in case you were following stories about the Northern Lights, I wanted to flag that this might be something you might run across and just keep moving and don't engage. And well, that is just about everything I have to tell you about the sun solar cycle and the northern lights. Thank you for watching. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.